whenever oh. you're ready, let me know. Oh, hey, Chris. Hey, Chuck. How are you? Uh, I am good. We're back at it. We are back at it. So funny story about last week's episode. Um, you know, as soon as I said the word candy stash, my son started freaking out and was panicking that I was going to steal all of his Halloween candy. So <laughs> somebody might have heard some background noise there as that was going on. That is kind of awesome. We we have those discussions in our house all the time because Macy sometimes will purchase her own Nestle Crunch bag and uh, occasionally they disappear. And I've been accused of uh, being guilty. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. This uh the the chunk or treat situation we went to was definitely there are some parents flexing with the full size candy bars. Uh, so you know, what what did the D's bring? The D's brought a cookie cake, uh, because the D's also forgot to get some for a trunk or treat and we were at the grocery. I was like, all right, this and it was a hit because we were the only cookie cake, um, which you know, many of you know that cookie cake is a um uh is prized in our household. So Yes. Uh, in fact, I may need to pick up one for tomorrow for a birthday celebration at clinic. But I have two, two, I guess I would say hand society activities that I want to plug. And I feel very strongly about both of these. The first is I received my copy in the mail of the new hand uh, society ASSH surgical anatomy series. I believe you may have contributed to this series, Dr. D. Did you? I, I believe the debut Perhaps oh. the first book in the series with the cover art from none other than uh, Mr. Frederick Stivers, the husband of our partner, Dr. Lindley Wall. Um, but yes, I was the co-editor on the first book in the series. Excellent. And the series survived your, your edition. And uh, it may have culminated here um, with Ulnar Sided Wrist Disorders, edited by Sanj Kakar and Jeff Yao. And I got mine uh, as an author of a chapter in the mail, and it is fantastic. It is absolutely comprehensive, and it is well illustrated, uh, both with line drawings and with photographs. It's well described. Any and everything on the owner wrist is is caught in this book. It's nearly 500 pages, and I cannot say enough good things about this book. Now, I haven't obviously read it all in a couple of days, but I've skimmed it all and read a few chapters, and it's great. So I want to plug that for all you older sided wrist pain interested people. Yes, because that that topic clearly has been figured out. So uh, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's why it deserves 500, 600 pages. That's great. Yes. Um, is there anything in particular that makes the book so good? Is it just a list of authors um, you know, that, that have come together because uh, Sanj and Jeff are, are so great at pulling people together? Yeah, I think that's part of it. They got a good group of authors. They have, you know, there's a lot of chapters. I mean, you could imagine, oh, let's come up with five or six chapters. There's, I don't know how many there were, there are probably 30 chapters. And uh, so they really took a look at it from every angle. And so I think it will serve as a Bible for many. And I, and I mean that when I say it, I, I was super impressed. Um, so for those of you that are going to be at the next Hand Society meeting, which is going to be in Toronto, make sure you bring your book. Chuck will be signing them. Um, he'll be placing inscriptions, doing personal dedications, maybe taking pictures. There might be an author booth, like that kind of thing. I'm not the editor of this one. I'm just. Wait, a he'll sign your. Author. He'll sign your. He'll sign your chapter for yeah, sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> what else? What else is going on? What else do you want to talk about? So the other thing, and I, I may have mentioned this to you, I. Um, Part of what I enjoyed about the hand study was I found, um, this is a weird thing to say, I think, I found enjoyment in some of the committee meetings. Uh, one was the Touching Hands Committee, which we talked about, um, but the other was the Business of Hand Surgery Committee, which I've been on intermittently for a lot of years. And I think the young leadership is great. And uh, there now is the, you know, the Hand P, which is modeled after Handy. So Handy is the you know, electronic hand surgery education platform with videos. It's, you know, phenomenal. And Hand P is a similar concept. Jeff Greenberg uh, supported this where there are uh, practice and life lessons on economics and all those kind of things that really matter to all of us. And so that is a great resource and it is supplemented by the Hand P podcast. And so listen to it. It's good. It's very good, and it's a worthwhile use of your time, and I just wanted to say that. So I've actually had a couple of people come up to me asking how I feel about there being another 
podcasts in the hand surgery space. I think it's great. Uh, you know, I, I think that they're going to have a hard time keeping up with uh, Chuck and all of his charisma and the magic that he brings to this uh, this show. Um, but in all seriousness, I have listened to a couple of, of the episodes and they're fantastic. Uh, you know, David uh, Way has done a great job with it. Uh, the production is fantastic. It's not as good as Chuck's production quality, but uh, it's pretty darn good. So, yes, please check it out. Please listen to it. Yeah, for sure. And we were going to, I think, just dive into a clinical topic that, um, you know, we haven't really talked about it since an early three part episode, uh, which was one of our most downloaded, maybe it's one of our certainly our top five downloaded episodes on Dupuytren's disease. So yeah, we we had the fortune of um, of being joined by uh, um, by Charlie Eaton for that one, and you know, gosh, he knows so much about it that I feel like it might have been hard for some to kind of get a high level view on Dupuytren's. So you know, I guess what I'd ask you, Chuck, is you know, where do you see you know your go? -to, what are your go to treatments for Dupuytren's in two thousand twenty two, and does that vary based on kind of how? Um, which which components of the finger are involved and you know has your experience changed even since when we recorded that episode a couple of years ago yeah it's it's actually crazy to say that i think i've been doing and favoring the needle apneurotomy procedure or i just call it the needle procedure i've been doing that operation since 2008 uh in the office and have had what i feel is a lot of success with it um and really like it i do not um, and we should talk about each of these, but I don't use Xyaflex. Uh, I don't see the the point really uh, when I when I enjoy and have had good success with the needle procedure. And interestingly, over the last six months, I've done more open fasciectomies, big open fasciectomies. And uh, it, you know, in a training situation, there's nothing like it. I think it's fantastic for trainees, and thankfully, patients are really happy with it. it just comes with um, you know conversations about recovery period, but um, you know, I don't know that anything has dramatically changed since we interviewed Charlie. Uh, the literature hasn't dramatically changed, but we should we can touch on that. Um, but Dupuytren's rem remains a disease which is interesting, and I believe hand surgeons can really help patients. Yeah, one hundred percent agree. And you know, I guess before we get into the details of a needle and your indications, when you think it's great, when you're pushing the indications and technique and the logistics. I would agree with you on the collagenase. Um, you know, I, I don't have a role for it in my practice. Um, for completeness sake, when I started, I actually looked into offering it just because I think it would have been good for our group to have somebody that offers it. Um, but just looking into it logistically, financially, um, in terms of, you know, our practice would have had to buy and hold the product, um, which I think is can be good for some practice environments. So for example, like a private practice environment, I think financially there can be some benefit there. Um, but for us, with me not knowing exactly how much I would use it, um, to have to hold on to inventory and spend on buying it, storing it, et cetera, it, it was a deal breaker. And that's right. And that's exactly the hurdle I also faced. It just didn't make sense. Now, thankfully, one of our plastic surgery colleagues, Ida Fox, continues to offer collagenase. And I send patients to her if they really are set, you know, if they see the John Elway commercial and they want, uh, they want collagenase, I say, okay, you know, we have a, have a great friend who does this and uh, you'll be happy with her care. But for me, it doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. I will say there is one intervention that I am absolutely against. And that is radiation therapy. Have you encountered, or worse, have you had to operate on patients who are post-radiation treatments? I have not. Uh, you know, I will say that I've actually treated somebody who offers that treatment uh, in a different context. And, you know, uh, we talked about the pros and cons of the radiation, and we agreed to kind of, you know, if we have patients that want a specific thing to refer, uh, it just hasn't come to that yet. But I have not had the... Uh, the opportunity to treat a patient who's already had radiation. That was actually the next question I was going to ask you before we get into the needle was what are your indications for radiation? Why do you feel so strongly against it? Well, I did review the literature and uh, in, in preparation for this, as I, I know you like to do for, in preparation for this conversation. And uh, there, the literature is not supportive. It, it's not necessarily against it. There's just not supportive literature. My problem with that treatment is if you have to go back and do a fasciectomy, it is a bear. Because not only are you fighting Dupuytren's disease, you're fighting an incredible amount of scar tissue. So I, for that reason, uh, I'm not a fan. 
Yeah, it's, it sounds like something that is done by somebody who doesn't have to take care of the the end result if it ever comes to a um, to recurrence or treating it surgically. Um, so I, I guess my question for you is, can you just at a high level for somebody who might be early in training or isn't familiar with the concept, what is a needle aponeurotomy? So, um, you know, this is a procedure that uh, originated in Paris, as I understand it, by a group of rheumatologists who have been doing it for a long time. And Charlie was one of the first uh, United States surgeons to go over there and train. And he brought it back to the States. And I believe it was in 2006 or so, he gave a great talk at the Hand Society. Uh, I'm not sure you were a physician then, Dr. D, um, but maybe you were. And uh, that's where I got motivated. And it was one of those scenarios that just the, the chips fell perfectly. I come back to St. Louis, I'm like, that's intriguing. And in one week, two patients come in, not surgical candidates because of cardiac issues, beautiful pre cords. And in the office, you inject a tiny bit of lidocaine just to numb the skin because the cord is a neural. So it doesn't hurt to divide the cord. It's just the skin. And you don't want to put a lot of numbing medicine in because you want everything awake around it. You want to know if you get too close to the nerves. And you essentially take a relatively stout needle and you move it back and forth and you divide the cord. And the first stick of lidocaine patients hate. And after that, they kind of get through the little lidocaine injections, which are done with a 25 or 27 gauge needle. And then I use a 22, sometimes a 20 with a really uh, impressive cord. And I think it's safe and it's incredible. It's incredible to take a patient, especially with an isolated MP contracture, divide a pretendous cord, and in the office, the patient's fully straight. It, it, there's nothing like it. It's incredible. So that was a rave review, five-star review from Chuck Goldfarb about needle laparotomy. Um, so question, do you put it in, do you divide the cord in multiple places? Is it two or three spots? Um, you know, because I know you could theoretically just do it in one, but I've, you know, at least the way I was taught was to try to do it in two or three different spots. Yeah, a couple of, uh, I guess I can say they're pearls, at least from my own experience. Uh, number one, I do try to do it uh, in multiple spots. Now, certain cords don't actually allow that because when you divide it once, it, you're done. And it's not this really stout, thick stuff that requires multiple le multiple different levels of division. Um, but I generally try to do it in more than one location. I do counsel the patients that we're not taking out the stuff. You know, we're not taking out the Dupuytrens. That's really important that they understand because you don't want them to be disappointed that there's still lumpiness in their palm. Um, and then sometimes I can try to work to decrease some of the skin tethering. Uh, and Charlie would talk about that, separating the cord from the skin when it's been tethered. Uh, that can be a little trickier to do. Um, but I, I think that the, the immediate results are just, there's nothing like it. Now, do you also, will you use this for only isolated pretendinous cords with MP involvement? How adventurous are you with getting to um, contractures that affect the PIP joint? So very, I've become very comfortable for better or worse uh, with a tackling almost any cord that I can palpate. I don't use ultrasound. And I, I think, you know, you may be someone who eventually uses that modality to help you. Um, I don't use ultrasound, but if I can palpate a cord, um, then I'm willing to try it. Now, I do lay a lot of crepe about risks, but I think if you get close to a nerve, patient is going to tell you, and I think you can be pretty cautious. Now, a spiral cord uh, can be tricky, um, but I will tackle different cords in the finger itself, but I do have a, a, I guess I would say a low threshold for calling it if the patient's getting any kind of tingling or sensory feedback, which thankfully has been rare. Yeah, when I started in practice, you know, this is one of those procedures where I never got to physically do it, like my hands doing it until I was in practice because the attendings would always do it. Uh, so I was obviously, I felt comfortable with the indications, felt comfortable with the theoretical aspects of the technique, but not the actual manual aspects. So I started saying, I'm only going to do MP contractures and I'm not going to do anything else, any PIP contractures. I mean, that was, I guess now seven years ago and I still am only doing MP contractures. I'm not doing PIP contractors just because I'm not comfortable with that. And I think that, you know, uh, for me, there's still a role for going to the operating room with anything that involves the PIP joint. Um, I absolutely get what you're saying. I think that it's, if you're comfortable with that and you can palpate the cord, um, I just would rather uh, have access to what I need access to. So I haven't gone there yet. 
Um, technique wise, I think that Charlie described it as using the needle attached to a syringe and holding the syringe. What I've done is just honestly hold the safety hub of the needle, um, and not had to use a syringe. I usually, I go with the Marty Boyer quote of telling the patient ahead of time, it's going to look like a crime scene, um, because of all the percutaneous kind of bleeders you might get into. Um, and you know, have a healthy amount of four by fours, a stack with alcohol on it, a stack that's dry, have the dressings ready for the end. Um, you know, and, uh, I, you know, I've, I've been very happy with, uh, with the results that I've done. I, I, you know, depending on the day in clinic, I'd be curious to see how you handle this. I'll see them. And if the clinic is going perfectly well, I might offer it to them on the spot. Um, but most of the times I'll say, why don't you, we can do this. Let's just schedule a time. Usually it's at the beginning of clinic or at the end of a clinic in a, in a, on a different day. Are you just doing it right up, right at the time? I try to if the patient wants, but but if it's uh, I've, I'm, like you, I think I've had really, really busy clinics lately. And and depending on the needle procedure, now some needle procedures literally take three minutes and some of them can take 10 or 15 minutes. But 10 or 15 minutes, uh, as you know, can disrupt a clinic entirely. So I have scheduled patients in, you know, down the road. And thankfully, some patients are, would rather be scheduled um, down the road. I like your pearls there. Those are those are really important things. And I would, I would ask you, you know, there are pre cords that are simple, thin, and you see that patient, you're like, wow, I can help you. This is not going to be a big deal. You're going to love this. And then there's pre cords that have nodularity and are super thick. And I, I, my experience has been, we can be successful, but it's just, it can be tough. Right. Absolutely. There's that, you know, that nodular clumping kind of thing. And especially for me, if it gets beyond the Palmer digital, digital crease, I get super worried. Um, not because I don't think you can do it. It's just, it's a slog. And, you know, I think patients have a certain amount of time in them when you're picking at them um, to, you know, in which they will allow you and tolerate it and still be somewhat happy. Um, but because, you know, you're in a clinic setting, the vibe is different than if you're, they've amped themselves up to go to the operating room. I think that it has to be a super, I have to be super confident that this is going to work and work quickly. Um, I don't have all the time in the world for that one. Um, I'm curious what, how you handle post-op or post-procedure splinting and mobilization, anything like that. Do you send them to therapy for a splint? How do they, how often do you ask them to wear it? That kind of thing. Yeah, I have to say I have mixed emotions. There is some literature saying it's not particularly helpful. Um, I, it, it is interesting to me that patients who are coming back for a second needle procedure, which is obviously fine and great, and and they know what they're getting into, most of them don't want another splint. Um, but when I do a splint on a patient that may have a couple of fingers that are involved, maybe more severe contracture with successful needle procedure, I splint them at night for at least six weeks. Uh, that's my general protocol. What about you? I do nighttime for two to four weeks, um, depending on how severe it is. And then uh, daytime ad lib and then, you know, finger range motion, you know, flexion, et cetera, during the day. Yeah. And I'll say that, and we should talk about open fasciectomies. I'll say with open fasciectomies, I don't send all those patients for a splint either, even though most of them by definition are more severe. Um, I just have, I mean, some of them I do if it's a very severe case, but not all of them. Uh, just because I think it's it's the mechanical solution. And and I think splinting, as Charlie Eaton said, may not have much of a role. Right, right. So what what are your, when do you indicate somebody off the bat for going to the operating room? Um, the first indication is a patient that I don't think would do well with a needle procedure, which is remarkably rare. I've only regretted, I think, two people having tried a needle and just, it, it was too much for them. Like personality wise, emotionally, is that what you mean? Or the cord yes. itself? Yeah. Personality, emotionally. I think I lay enough crepe that even if we're not successful and that's thankfully been uncommon, that patients are okay with that. Yeah. Let's try the needle. If it doesn't work, we can always go to the OR. That's kind of the, the crepe. So um, I think the indications for going to the operating room are a severe PIP contracture. So more than, you know, 45 or 50 degrees, a non-palpable cord, a severe recurrence uh, after a needle, whether that's, you know, a year later or five years later. And in a patient who's had a needle and understands what that means uh, and why, you know, repeating it may or may not make sense. So I, I always present it as an option. Um, but for some, I certainly guide the patient towards an open fasciectomy. Now, is there any role for Wallant in this case? I mean, for doing it awake in the operating room or are you purely going to, you know, at least some level of sedation. So I have done a couple. 
and I have to say, I, I don't love it. It, it, um, this, these can be super technically challenging, uh, which is why they're great for residents and fellows to experience. Um, they can be frustrating um, and, you know, protecting the nerves and arteries can be tricky. And um, so I, I don't know that I'll, unless it's something really straightforward, in which case I probably would be doing a needle. Um, I, I don't think I like Wallant for this procedure, but I'm guessing you do. You know, I've, I've, I've used it and still would use it if a patient feels very strongly, but I usually, you know, for the same reasons you stated, you know, the window in which Wallant is going to make a difference and add to the surgery is very little in this. Um, so while I've used it in the past, I'm using it less just because, you know, if, if it's something that can be done awake, it's usually something that can be done with the needle. Um, and, you know, I, I know that you like to drop a lot of F-bombs at times and, you know, it's kind of hard to entertain the patient and do the surgery safely with this kind of thing. We've talked about the showmanship aspect of Volant, uh, at least in my experience. And, um, you know, I think that it can be quite challenging. So I typically, if we're going to the operating room, this is something that, you know, sometimes can be done under Ivy Regional or beer anesthetic. If you feel like it's something that would be within that window of time in which your anesthesiologist is comfortable with that. Um, but other times it's, it's done under regional with the tourniquet. Yeah, to totally agree. And I guess I used to be of the belief that Bruner zigzag incisions were the only way to go. And I'll and let me be clear, I do not, and I'll say this strongly, and I know there'll be listeners who disagree, write us and tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, I do not like straight line incisions that after you've completed the procedure, you create z plasties with. I just don't think that works particularly well. So I like either zigzag incisions, which is all I used to do. I've done a lot more mid-lateral kind of combination, um, Bruner plus mid-lateral, and then maybe bring it back over the middle phalanx or something. But I found that to be really successful. Do you think it's just if the spiral cord is sitting along that side where you're going to make the mid-lateral component of your incision? Yeah, I, I think you can get better exposure and I think you have a nice flap uh, to bring over, it, it just, it gives me nice exposure. And again, I still like the zigzags. I just try to, you know, there's not one standard way for me to approach this. It's just based on what the disease looks like and having enough exposure. Um, what principles do you follow? So let's say you have a, a little finger cord that affects the MP and PIP joint. How do you think about your incisions and where do you find the nerves and talk through it? I tend to do mainly Bruner zigzag incisions. I will incorporate a mid-axial, especially if it's in an area that's not going to be where they're resting on it. Um, you know, I've been taught by my therapy colleagues that patients uh, really pay attention to corners. So during the closure, I try to make the corners look as nice as we can, especially if they're coming out and going to a splint and they're going to see their incision pretty early on. Corners can look really gnarly to patients, so you got to make sure those look great. And on these, I tend to err on the side of putting in more sutures, which I usually don't, but I've been told by my wonderful therapy colleagues that that is more, patients don't like seeing anything that looks like it could be exposed deep tissue. Um, so those are little pearls for incisions. Um, you know, for me, my, you know, my principles are that I typically will find the neurovascular bundle proximal and distal. Um, doesn't mean I automatically go out and find it distally. I'll find it proximally, kind of see where it's lying relative to the pathologic tissue. Um, and then as soon as I'm, I'm no longer comfortable knowing exactly where it is, then I'll go find it distal to that area where I'm working. Um, that's probably the biggest thing for me. Um, and also knowing where the tendon is, the flexor tendon. Yeah, it's well said. I mean, it. Um, I feel strongly about finding the nerve and artery proximally, uh, tracing them distally. And if it goes well, you just trace them distally and take out the duplicates. If you really get into a, um, you know, a concrete situation where your the nerve disappears, then I go more distal and then trace it backwards as well. Um, I think that's really important, um, protecting the tendon sheath and, you know, taking the duplicates off the tendon sheath, off the skin, really important. I like what you said about closure because, you know, really what we're doing with these patients is we're insulting the hand in a major way with this big ex excision. And then we're, I send them to therapy pretty early. I operate on Wednesdays primarily for this kind of surgery. So either Friday or the following Monday, they start therapy because I want them working on flexion. So I do put a lot of stitches, but one major change in my practice is I put 4-0 nylon as my corner stitches, and then I use an absorbable stitch in addition to that so that we're not completely torturing the patient at the time of suture removal. 
and you still have strength when you take your stitches out at 10, 12 days. So that's been a nice little curl, which uh, the therapists have appreciated and the nurses that I work with in clinic have also appreciated. Sure. Is that a five over P like you do for a kid or is that a four O monocryl or a chromic or something like that? It's been a chromic. It's been a four or five O chromic simply because that's available. Um, I, I don't know that it matters too much, um, but I, I've been using a four or five O chromic. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. No, I think for, for me, absorbable sutures in the, on the Palmer surface of the hand and digit have not gone as well. So I'm reassured by your experience uh, and maybe I'll incorporate that because again, nobody likes taking more sutures out, nor patient, nor um, our medical uh, team. Um, I actually have started to send patients directly to therapy uh, right afterwards, mainly so they can get, I think, a much more comfortable orthosis than I can provide. Uh, it's lighter. Um, you know, I think that, uh, and then they get plugged into therapy and I start motion three days after surgery. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, having them in a smaller orthosis is I think helpful as long as they're able to go on the same day. I usually have been asked by my therapy colleagues to make sure they eat something light before they go over there. Uh, because and usually the pack, you will make sure that they have some, a nice selection of snacks before they, uh, before they leave anyway. So, yeah, I like that. Um, I don't splint everyone. Do you, I mean, I guess you just said you don't because you're sending right to therapy. I used to splint every single patient with, you know, four by 15s as a kind of volar supportive splint. I don't do that anymore. Um, I do, if it's a really severe case, I will splint, but I usually do it in intrinsic plus and the other patients, I'll just do a soft dressing and tell the patient that when you go to therapy, they, they, if you go to therapy, when you go to therapy, they will make you an extension splint. Yeah, no, they, with me, they leave the operating room in a four by 15 plaster extension splint, usually forearm based, um, but they'll go to therapy. I, you know, if they may have it taken off within a few hours or, you know, if there's an issue getting in, at least I know that they've been, they're immobilized. Um, but with the expectation that they're not hanging out in that for two weeks, like they're getting out as quickly as we can. And we try to arrange for that. Um, I guess to bring us to a close, I, I'd be curious to see your experience with, you know, um, recurrence rate, not that it ever happens to you, but your experience and kind of how you've seen that come about and um, your interpretation of the literature, both with needles and with um, uh, with surgery. Yeah, I mean, look, you do this enough, you absolutely have recurrence. Um, it's just, it, it, you know, we are, it's, I feel like we're sort of, um, you know, we're, we're patch treating um, these patients. We're not treating the root cause of Dupuytren's we're treating the symptoms of Dupuytren's. And so Charlie Eaton was, of course, correct. We need to find the molecular answer, not the surgical answer to this problem, kind of like we've done with rheumatoid arthritis. And so um, there will be recurrence by definition. The reason for an open surgery is, and I say this to patients directly, it's the longest disease-free interval. And so the patient can rest assured that if we do an open procedure, while the disease is almost certainly going to come back, it's going to be down the road, five years or more, typically. Um, and with a needle, it may be much sooner. And with collagenase, it may be much sooner. Um, that's my basic speech. I think, you know, collagenase and the needle procedure are pretty similar. It depends on which articles you read, but pretty darn similar. Um, and so that's where it gets to cost for me. Uh, but the open fasciectomy is, remains the gold standard in my view. Yeah, there's a nice paper from uh, a retrospective paper from Mayo Clinic. I believe Marco Rizzo was the senior author on that one. Um, that demonstrated results are very similar in terms of recurrence rates between needles and uh, and collagenase, and the expense is hugely different um, and much more expensive with collagenase. And perhaps that is different based on where you practice in terms of whether you're in the U.S. or elsewhere. Um, but that I think matters a lot to patients, um, you know, especially if like you know, they're being asked to pay for this medication out of pocket if it's not covered by their insurance. Um, so that can be a difference maker for sure. Um, and yes, the the, the disease-free interval and the recurrence rate, the disease-free interval is longer and the recurrence rate is less with surgical treatment, but it comes with the upfront investment, both in time and um, cost for the patient and their insurance company. Yeah. The last thing I have to say is um, I always let the tourniquet down. I always try to make sure we have good hemostasis because nothing compromises results like a hematoma. Uh, this is one of the few procedures where I do that. Um, and you learn what white is, what a really white finger is and a finger that's sort of white. And sort of white, I've learned to just immediately ignore. Really white gets your attention. And for all those surgeons listening, you, you know, when you see really white, you know it, you don't forget it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess, do you ever pin the finger uh, still? I know that some people talk about pinning joints uh, 
you know, because then that's the point where you see really white. Maybe you kind of back out that pin. With with almost zero exceptions, I do not pin PIP joints anymore, whether that's treatment for a camptodactyly, uh, PIP contracture related to trauma or Dupatrins. I did that in my youth, <laughs> which no longer is with me. I do not pin joints anymore. I don't think it adds an advantage. And I'll say this. This is actually important. I almost never do volar plate releases for Dupatrins. I believe if you excise all the Dupatrins tissue, generally that does it. And then occasionally I'll do some soft tissue. I'll do a manipulation of the PIP joint. But I cannot remember the last time I did a PIP uh, volar plate release. Um, and so I, I feel good about that. And I feel therefore, because we know the results, when you do a formal PIP joint release, age old results say, you will only keep 50% of that improvement. But I think if you do a more standard Dupatrin's excision, you can expect better results than that. And I'm assuming you're not, when you talk to patients at a time, you're not uh, counseling them that full extension is the expectation. Is that correct? I, I, I don't promise that. I say that's our goal and we might have it in the operating room. Whether we can keep it will depend on you, <laughs> you and your efforts with therapy. Yeah. And they're honestly, they're usually happy that they can put their hand in the pocket and get their hand in the glove. If you get them something that's reasonable in terms of less than 30 degrees at both joints. Um, so and that's kind of what I counsel them for. And usually that's what they're looking for is I want to be able to put my hand in my pocket. I want to be able to get a glove on in the winter. Um, so I, that's, that has worked out for me. Um, so I am, uh, I'm, I'm excited to hear how other people feel about this. Uh, if you are a staunch collagenase advocate, please let us know um, and also let us know your conflicts of interest if you have any, but <laughs> the John Elway commercial is great and it is a very powerful education tool. And then I just redirect them to a needle. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we're going to get any offers to sponsor the podcast uh, from the collagenase folks, but Hey, we're, we're just being honest here. Yeah, chuck, chuck, honest. Will, chuck will listen to all offers and we'll continue to not <laughs> use it. But... <laughs> awesome. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. Thank you.